Yes, hello, it's Joe here live for Joyrider TV, back with some more scintillating Q&A. You bring the questions and I will see what I can do about having some good answers to those questions. Um, so the biggest thing that's been going on of late with the Joyrider TV community is just in the last week, we've launched a Discord server called the, um, what's it called? The Joyrider Sailing Exchange. Um, and I'm just going to put a link in the live chat now, and there'll be a link in the video description later if you want to get involved. So there is the link in the live chat. Um, so what is it and what is it for? Well, basically, it is an online chat room which um, anybody can join. And I've set it up so that um, the idea is so if you're traveling from one part of your country to another part of the country and you'd quite like to go sailing when you get there, but you don't know anybody to go sailing with there is a fair chance that there will be a member of the global Joyrider TV community who are there. So by putting on the Discord chat that you're going to um, wherever it is you're going to and you would like to get on a boat with someone, someone might see that and go, yes, I've got a boat. That's where I live. Why don't you get on my boat with me? And then before you know it, you'll be sailing with your new best friend and then you can offer your your services as well if you've got a boat and you like taking people out put it on the discord chat and people might see that and go well I'm going there uh, in a couple of weeks and then before you know it we've got more people going sailing and you're getting more use out of your boat meeting new people good times are here again. So that is what we are up to. All right, I'm just going to say hello to everyone who is in the live chat already. So we've got Fred on board. Hello, Fred. Great to have you with us. Leland Lee is there from Clearwater, Florida. Great stuff. All right, Zach is home and he's joined in today. Great to hear it and great to have you with us. Um, unfortunately, my ability to read uh, Russian or that kind of text is extremely limited. So apologies uh, to anybody using that alphabet because I just can't read it. Um, we've got Benedetto from the Tyrrhenian Sea. Wow. I don't even know where that is. All right. Matthew's on board from Baltimore, USA. We've got Martin on board as well. Martin from Malcheski Composites. Oh, yes. So if you weren't tuned in last week, um, you missed a treat because what we are looking at, you'll like this, Martin, is on the speed stick, there has been offered up a Hobie getaway competition. And whoever is the fastest Hobie getaway on the speed stick by the end of the year is going to win as sponsored by uh, Joyrider TV and anybody else who wants to chip in uh, Malcheski Pro Joyrider Tiller Extension to really pimp that Hobie getaway. I think this is a great idea and um, your getaway is no never going to have felt as good as when you're holding one of those sweet tiller extensions in your hand. So there we go. And hello, Martin. All right, Ewan's on board. Ewan, one of the, the Wild Wind team of 2022. He says, new shed, Joe. Well, funny you should ask. Yeah, one of the big, well, not one of, probably the biggest project to be undertaken in recent years is currently underway where um, we've got, um, some of the Wild Wind team, Ollie and Ash, slaving away on the Wild Wind beach right now, 
while I'm doing this, uh, taking the old shed to bits. It's a big shed um, and getting all the stuff out of it so that it can be replaced with a brand new facility on the Wild Wind Beach. Uh, this is a massive undertaking and um, shame not anybody else fancied coming out to give us a hand. All right, Stefan's on board. Good morning. Isabel's on board. Hello, Isabel. All right. Oh, uh, Benedetto says the Tyrrhenian Sea is in Italy. Fort di Marmi. There we are. All right. Kevin's on board from Kiel in Germany. Great to have you with us, Kevin. Also coming in from Germany, we've got Max. No wind in southern Germany today, so I'm just back from biking until I've reached the snow. Just back in time. Great stuff. Great to have you with us, Max. Uh, we've also got Mr. Tony KP in uh, Denmark. Tony's wife checking in. He is here as well, of course. Great stuff. Great to have you all here with us. All right. Yeah. So while you're watching this, like Leland Lee has done, you could sign up for the Discord um, group and have a little chat, side chat going on over there, if you fancy. I'm not paying attention to that while I'm doing this. I'd be far too distracted. So um, as you were, get involved. If um, you've only just tuned in, if you want to get involved uh, with the Discord chat as well, you'll find the link at the top of the live chat. Um, there we are. If you're watching this later, if you've just tuned in, I don't know how that would have worked, but the link will also be in the video description below. All right. It's probably getting on for time to talk about a question uh, at some point, although it's good to say hello. We've got Mark on board from Northern Ontario, Canada. Thanks for tuning in. Joachim is with us. Uh, it was Joachim who actually set up the Discord server. He's in Argentina, I believe, um, doing very well. And we're just going to come on to your preloaded question in a jiffy. All right, Martin says, sounds great. I think he's very keen to get his tiller extensions on a few Hobie getaways. Um, we probably need to talk. Yes, I should think we probably should at some point. All right, Chris is on board from, I don't know if he's in Galveston Bay, Texas, but certainly in Texas. Nice to have you with us, Chris. Uh, Fred says, on a cruise in the fall, visiting hello, Catacolon, what would it be like to try and visit? Too far, I expect. Catacolon. I don't, I don't actually know where that is, to be honest, Fred. But um, we're on the west side of Greece, just south of Corfu, north of Kefalonia. Um, so, uh, but what is good in Greece at the moment, the biggest developments in Greece at the moment is the road network is getting better and better all of the time. So you can traverse the country in much less time than it used to take. So if you are in the country, in the right part of the country, before the middle of October, then yes, you should head over to sunny Vasiliki Bay and get a bit of that champagne sailing action with us out here. Very nice too. All right, Chris is in the port of Houston today. Uh, we've got Frederick. Hello from sunny Sweden. Oh my goodness. We've got sunshine in Sweden. Very good. All right. Sounds like it's absolutely chucking it down here in not very sunny Greece at the moment. Uh, yes, it has been pretty nice, but the rain has come once again. But that's good for the grapes. Mm. Greek wine. It's a new, uh, new taste. All right, we've got Tim on board. You're the best. Ah, oh, stop. Um, Ryan's here from Maui. Uh, nice to have you with us. Soaked up, soaked with heavy rains for a couple of weeks. Oh, no. Yeah, I know how it feels. But anyway, question number one from contestant number one, and that's Joaquin uh, in Argentina, who 
he sails a Wildcat F-18, which has got a self-tacking jib. He says, my jib traveller um, is getting stuck when the sheet is pretty tight. It's worse, but it's also a problem in other conditions. The rail does have a few dings and scratches, but they were already there, but it seems to be getting worse. I already tried the usual cleaning and silicon spray, but this really doesn't solve it. Maybe you've got some experience with this. Maybe I do. All right, let's draw a picture. Been waiting to draw a picture. Really like drawing the pictures, actually. Um, even the ones that don't come out so well. So um, what should we draw? Let's draw. There's the front of the hulls. We will have. There's our front beam. Um, and let's have our self tacking jib track. Not to scale. So first of all, for those of you who don't know about a self tacking jib, you may think, what is this witchcraft of which you speak? Well, it is exactly as it sounds. What we have in front of the front beam, as indicated here, is a curved track, much like your traveller track. And on it, you'll have much like your traveller car. And then attaching to the traveller car uh, is the jib. Something like, nothing like that, in fact. But um, it will attach to the corner of the jib. And it means when you turn the boat through the wind, the wind just catches the other side of the jib and blows it across. So when you're tacking or jibing or changing tack generally, you never have to act physically change the jib from one side to the other. And then the, the other nice thing with the self-tacking jibs is um, you, it, the system is completely continuous. So this is a cleat, uh, by the way. And as is this on here. So the sheet ends up on both sides, but you don't have to use the sheet from the opposite side like you would on a conventional system. You can use the one that's closest, which makes it a lot easier to get it uncleated and cleated and uh, altering the tension there because the whole system is continuous. Very good. But Joaquin's problem is that the travel the car is getting jammed. Now, um, it could be that the track, uh, the car isn't running very nicely on the track. So what I would perhaps have a look at first is just these tracks do move up and down just because the angle of the jib isn't always going to be the same. So just making sure that the track is absolutely clear of other ropes and things. Uh, not uh, Just do it when you're not sailing. Just run the, the car with a little bit of tension in it. Maybe put... Um, uh, a rope onto it or something, run the car from one side to the other a couple of times, pulling on it quite hard just to see if there are any sticky bits. But I wouldn't expect it to be that because the um, the this car is not under as much load as your main traveller car. Um, so what I would expect it to be and what I've experienced in the past is you might have various lines which are going underneath the track. So it might be, um, we generally have some, so if lines which have blocks attached like that, so that the sheets 
then go underneath the track, through the block, and then forwards. And if the ropes holding those blocks are the wrong length, then they can actually be touching the underside of the track. So when the car gets to those ropes, um, those ropes will actually stop the car from going any further. Um, there could be some other ropes involved there, but I would just really have a look at it when it's rigged and on land, just push the track from one side to the other. And you could actually see if it's just jamming generally or if it's jamming in certain positions and then see if there's any ropes or anything that is in the way obstructing it. Because what might happen is when the jib is in one position, this track might sit a bit higher up, which means on the beach, maybe it looks like there's nothing that's going to foul the track. But then when you get sailing and you crank it in, then perhaps the track is pulled more down, which means it's more likely to get uh, fouled by stuff, which is possibly underneath it. So that is my first suggestion. Suggestion number two, and I've seen the first two words that Martin has just written, new balls. Yes, in your, your traveller car here and in your main traveller car, if when it's going across, it's a bit grindy, then maybe it is time to replace your traveller car balls. Um, replacing the balls on these traveller cars is only applicable to the bigger boats like the Formula 18s, the Tornadoes, those sort of boats where um, you've got a ball bearing traveller car. So not on the Prindles, the smaller Prindles or the Hobie 16s and such. Um, do check out the video, how to replace your traveller balls. That will show you how to do it. Now, the alarming thing with the traveller balls is for a little bag of balls, it is more expensive than you would imagine. Apparently, these balls, I believe, are made of Teflon. And um, perhaps that's why it is expensive. All right. So just looking in the live chat for responses to this topic. Joachim says, the jib sheets are a problem for me but I already tested them, taking them out of the way. But the free car is having some issues itself. There are two or three places that it gets stuck. Yeah, perhaps that sounds like maybe it is a balls issue because what the balls do inside the car, if we, get, if we look at the bottom of the car, is you'll have... like a run of balls at the top and then the same at the bottom like this. And then the track goes in the middle thus. And what might happen is when, like Martin said, you might have some flattened balls, which means when those flattened balls come to the top, then it might start grinding a bit. Um, it could be that. But worth also taking a small file to your track and just checking it for any bumps, uh, bits sticking out and um, just see if you can smooth it out a bit. All right, so just looking back. Um, okay, so I hope that that helps in some way, um, you know, Quint, uh, that is all I can suggest at the moment without actually seeing the traveller for myself. All right, back to the live chat. All right, Fred says too far, four hours one way. Mm, that is quite a long way. 
All right, Chris says we had 45 knots steady wind last night. Oh my days. That is a lot of steady wind, 45 knots. Crikey. All right, Scott is on board, dropping it in the slot. Uh, good morning from Cultus Lake. Um, probably not at Cultus Lake at the moment, probably somewhere nearby, I should think. All right, we've got Mark and Janet on board from Ohio. Great to have you with us, as always. All right, Hemmings Detail is with us and says, any recommendations to prevent the main halyard from scratching up the mast uh, when stored mast up on the beach? Yeah. Um, now, what could you do there? Um, I'm assuming you're talking... I'm assuming you're talking Hobie 16 just because, as we've said before, there are more Hobie 16s in the world than anything else. So the likelihood of it being a Hobie 16 is reasonable. And also the Hobie 16 has got the wire halyard, which will scratch the mast. Now, um, hmm. Just trying to think. Um, yeah, so it might actually be while you're sailing that the halyard is scratching the mast as well, because you've got the wire halyard running down the mast, and then where it's tied onto the rope a bit higher up will be where the um where the wire part of the halyard stops. So maybe while you're sailing that is going to be sort of shaking or vibrating a bit, which might be just uh, knocking into the mast. So really, there's not that much you can do about it, except what you could do. I say there's not much you could do about it. Yes, there is. All right. So if this is the, um, yeah, this is the right end. If this is the end of your wire part of the main halyard, what you could do is you could take, I would take some self amalgamating tape. That's the tape that really bonds to itself, making like a permanent rubber sort of hood that goes on to anything that you tape with it. It's really difficult to get off. In fact, you'd have to cut it off with a knife, but, what you could do if we have some red tape is to put self amalgamating tape around here. And that's going to be the bit which has got the sharp edges, which are going to do the most to scratch your mast. So tape that up with some self amalgamating. And then hopefully that will solve the problem either when the sail is up or when it's not. Um, when the sail's down and the boat's on the beach, if there's a lot of wind, then you could do the same at the other end as well. So on a on a 16, the other end just doesn't have the um it's a much longer loop uh, where the shackle goes to go onto the top of the mainsail, but you could do exactly the same thing there as well. And perhaps that would solve the problem. The other thing, if it's on land that you're more concerned about, you could do is you could actually take the halyard out of the mast track. Now, you may say, but you can't do it because the, um, the lug on the halyard runs inside the mast track. You can take it out. Um, if this is the mast... Yes, the lug on the halyard will largely run inside the track. So it's only that little bit of halyard that comes out. Uh, and there's your lug in there stopping it from coming out. But what you can do to get it out completely is if you tie another line, uh, that line will need to be about eight metres long to the um, to the uh, the 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 loop in the wire 
where you would attach the sail when you're not using it. If you tie a bit of rope on there, pull it all the way to the top, and then um, with this extra rope, go quite far back and pull it down backwards, that will actually mean that that lug is going to be outside of the mast track, which means that you could then secure the halyard, uh, maybe tie it tight to the back beam somewhere so it'll be away from the mast. Problem perhaps solved. So there we go. That is what I think on the topic of that. Thank you very much. All right, next. Matthew says, I want to replace my 1984 Hobie 16 original uh, jib halyard block assembly with the newer Aussie style jib halyard system. Is this a good idea? Um, the cheek block cleats are original. All right, well, um, now the one thing that, um, so for those of you who don't know, the Aussie style jib halyard system basically puts a bit more purchase on your jib halyard so that it makes it easier to get the right amount of tension. So this is all going to be at the bottom of the mast. So here's the mast. Then what we will have is we'll have um, a block mounted flat against the mast at the bottom here, which will be at the front of the mast. Then we'll have another block the same mounted on the side of the mast. Then we'll have a cleat, um, which is going to look similar to the block. And then we still have the horn cleat um, at the bottom of the mast. So rather than with the older boats, um, they would just have the horn cleat on the front of the mast. I'm not sure if that's the same in the USA, but in the European older boats, they just have the horn cleat on the front. But with these, what we do with this Aussie style, the halyard comes round, around that block, around that block, through the cleat. So that is a cam cleat, um, which makes it very easy to lock the halyard off. And then at the bottom, the horn cleat. So we're using the horn cleat as well as the cam cleat because we don't want to trust the cam cleat with all of that pressure, because that is a lot of pressure for a mere cam cleat to handle. So is it a big improvement to um, the performance of the boat? No, it won't improve your performance, but it will make it a lot easier to get your rig tension um, on to the sweet spot tight enough. Um, if you don't have the Aussie style, then what you definitely need to do to get enough rig tension on is what we call sweating the halyard, where you grab the rope that runs down the mast and you actually pull it out with the other end going through the cleat and then you pull that and then you repeat that to get the tension on. Whereas with this, you still need to do that, but not as much. Now, yes, this is an upgrade. It definitely makes it easier. But the downside of putting any fittings on the mast is you are putting more holes into your mast to um, put those fittings on. And every time you put another hole in the mast, there is another place where it could potentially leak. And I would say if it was my boat, I wouldn't upgrade to this system because I've experienced enough leaky masts in my time to know, even with the best intentions, like you use um, the, the caps on the pop rivets, um, which Hobie called, I don't know what they call them, actually rivet caps, which are basically like that and totally sealed. And then the pop rivet, 
goes in there into there into the hole uh with some sealant even with that over time um there is a good chance that this could uh start to be a potential source of water getting in the mast so i'd say if you're confident with your ability to seal the mast yes it's a good idea but if you're not as confident sealing the mast then i would say don't do it there we go that's a pretty full answer all right we've got unknown on board i'm watching you from france and i learned how to sail a hobie 16 just from joyrider tv that is really good to hear um thank you for letting me know um this is what makes it all seem worthwhile is when i am definitely uh providing some sort of assistance to so i'm not crying uh, to the global uh, Hobie Cat and Catamaran sailing community. So thanks for letting me know, Unknown. All right. So episode is on board. Add rubber tube around it. Yes. I think that's, yeah, similar kind of vibe to what I um, said with the self amalgamating tape. All right. We've got Paul on board in Italy. Great to have you with us, Paul. A bit late, but we'll see the recording. No problem at all. All right, here we go. Joachim says, this is this is new information for me. Don't use self-amalgamating tape. It looks great at the beginning, but after some time, the sun gets sticky and really messy. My boat was rigged with it and wasn't a great experience to clean. OK, so back to the drawing board there a little bit for a different type of tape. Um, I find that if you use electrical tape, which is very commonly used, I think electrical tape might even be more commonly used on sailing boats than on electrical things. It's unlikely, but it could be. Um, but the electrical tape, after that's been cooked by the sun a bit, that leaves a really horrible sticky mess. All right, thanks for that. All right, Paul says, I saw the first runs between the marks of the start of the third leg of the ocean race. And it seemed like our round the rock race in Vasiliki. Yes. Great stuff. Yeah. Um, the, uh, is it called the ocean race this time? Um, the ocean race is actually based on the round the rock race at Wildman sailing holidays. Very good. All right, Matthew says, on my boat, there is a block below the horn cleat. Both are mounted on the left side of the mast. Oh, right. OK. Yeah, I would say if you've already got a block below the horn cleat, you're kind of halfway there. Um, so I would say if you find it very difficult getting the rig tension on, then yes, upgrade. But if you find it not too much of a an effort then leave it as it is all right Joachim back with the tape uh heat shrink or other tapes he's used 3m3903 tape on the mast to protect it from the spinnaker halyard block and works very nicely so far so there you go that's 3m3903 tape i'll be checking that out myself All right, Matthew says at the bottom of the jib halyard is another block you can route the halyard rope through to get the two to one, three to one, like the Aussie system. Right, there we go. All right, so we've got Ollie Smith on board, one of this hardcore setup crew, um, uh, working on the Wildwind Beach. Who says up uh, having a lovely nap listening to the rain? That's nice. Yeah, so not uh, getting stuck in so much this afternoon. All right, Fred said, uh, Fred says that I said something a bit ago that caused me to go, hmm, the main halyard slug should be in the track raising the main. No, um, yeah, I can see what you're saying there, Fred. So um, not 
the main halyard slug itself, but the second one, the one that locks it in, um, definitely the one for the reefing point. There's no should or shouldn't, but just sometimes it does end up inside the mast track. Let's see if we can remember how this looks. So um, this is while the sail is going up. So we've got this soft eye to which the sail will be attached with a shackle. There's the top of the sail. And then, yeah, it would be the slug which holds the, the sail up at the top is the one which quite often will be inside the mast track when it's going up and down. Um, it really depends on your boat. I think boats are different quite a lot of the time, whether that's in or out of the mast track. I'm, on the Hobie Pacific, which uses the same system, that definitely goes in the mast track a lot. Perhaps not as much on the 16. Perhaps I need to be more observant next time I'm dropping one. Anyway, thank you. All right, Scott says, I've added the Aussie system and did, but did not upgrade the hardware in the mast. Not as convenient, but like Joe said, no new holes drilled in the mast. Very good. I'd say that sounds like a good way of doing it. Um, all right, so that's what Matthew is planning to do. Replace the pulleys and the halyard, but keep the original hardware mounted to the bottom of the mast. All right, Chris says electrical tape is the stuff that makes the sticky mess. All right. OK, very good. Very good. Um, very good. All right. So we've, we're all caught up uh, with the uh, live chat. So at this time, go take a short commercial break. Mm. That tastes so much better in a Joyrider TV bottle available at totaljoyrider.com. Since I've started doing these bottles, do you want to know how many I've sold? Probably about three. That's not very good. Um, are they too expensive? I don't think so. They um, they just they cost the same as other similar bottles by other bottle makers. Um, yeah. So there we go. Just just saying. Anyway, but thanks to everybody who has been supporting Joyrider TV. Uh, I'm just revving up to asking for some more support on Joyrider TV. Uh, I'm going to set up a crowdfunding for so that I can go and do the world championships this year on Lake Como, Italy in the tornado. But um, having just bought a house, I can't actually afford to go. So um, anyway, back to the live chat. Um, Matthew says, thanks very much for the advice, Joe and Scott. I'll probably do it since I want to replace the block anyway. All right. Very good. Good luck with that, Matt. And all right, the next preloaded question comes from Doby, who says, I'm just going to have to summarise the question. All right, so putting the mast up and down on a catamaran, what is the technique and what is required? Okay, so we're going to go for the... We're going, to, we're going to look at that now because I think it's quite interesting. Um, but the, the best advice would be, and the shortest one would be, there are videos that I've made on putting the mast up. And when you actually see it happening, that will really explain nicely how it works. But what we're doing when we're putting up the mast on a catamaran is we're using, doing it like a big lever going up so what we would do before raising the mast 
if this is the boat, this is this is getting fun now, isn't it? Yes. All right. So red for the mast, I think. So the mast, we would have like this before we hoist before we raise the mast. And then depending on the age of the 16 that you're using, um, will really affect what sort of security we've got to keep the bottom of the mast engaged in the um what do you call it the mast base in the mast step so the mast step would be on here yeah like a little almost like a little pool uh attached to the front beam and then the mast base has got the opposite to that and then on a 16 it would have like a nose like that and then on the back of the mast step would be oh i can't quite remember now actually but on the older boats it kind of goes like that and then on the inside there's like a pin which this locates into to give you some sort of security. Um, so is it easy to put the mast up solo? No, it is quite difficult, um, especially if you haven't done it before or if you're if you are definitely alone and um, there are techniques that we can use. Uh, next stage is once we've got the mast in position, we'll connect the shrouds, both sides. Um, and then what we do if there was two people um, is I would always have one person. People are in green standing at the base of the mast. Basically, his job is going to be just making sure that that bad boy stays where it should be and doesn't pop out just for security. Being careful, of course, not to get a finger caught in the mast step. That could really um, make the eyes water a bit. But um, that is the position for contestant number two. And then the best. The best. um option is if you've got three people that is very nice so what i would do is have contestant number three at the top of the mast who can lift the top of the mast up so that would be like this way and start to walk it whereas the next guy would actually be on the trampoline like this And he'll walk it as far as he can to the back of the boat. And then the guy on the trampoline would then take the mast and start to push it up. At the same time, this guy um, could take a trapeze line or um, a halyard or something that's coming from the top of the mast. Trapeze line is pretty normal. And just grab that at the front. and pull from here. So for that to be long enough until the mast's up a bit, oh, sorry, blue for the rigging. Um, until the mast's up a bit, you might have to tie an extra bit of rope onto that to make it long enough. And then you pull it up all the way until it's completely up. Then uh, the mast foot uh, supervisor can then get the forestay, attach that at the front, and then you are secure. So there we go. But um, that's as far as I'm going to go with this because the videos of it actually happening really do make it a lot more obvious how the process works. So do check out those videos on putting the mast up. Very good. <coughs>
Okay, Ryan in Maui says, by the way, you can be a YouTube member easily and contribute to the work monthly. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, you can also get a custom MOG like this sick honey cat replica. Yeah, true. Um, very nice. Yeah, so uh, YouTube channel memberships, very nice. And as well as the custom emojis, there is another perk of becoming a YouTube channel member. And what that is, is that basically as soon as I've finished making a video and I've uploaded it, then you will be, have access to that video before it actually goes out. So if you're the kind of person who really can't wait until 5.30 on a Sunday Greek time for show us your cat, then you'll get it as soon as it's ready, basically. That's nice. Um, yeah, and granted, there's not a lot of videos being made at the moment because this behemoth of a task at the Wildwind Beach is going on. But um, yeah, on the topic, there will be Show Us Your Cat coming this Sunday, and you're going to love it. It is a Hobie 18 special. We're only featuring Hobie 18s, and we're featuring Hobie 18s in Australia that are, this could be controversial, but I'm going to say the best looking Hobie 18s that I have ever seen. There we are. Just laying it down. That is what we're looking at at the weekend. So thanks very much. All right. So we've got, oh yeah, Fred says there is a vinyl tape has no glue that adheres to itself. I use this to bind the end of my battens. Easy to undo. No glue could be useful other places. Might be the 3M mentioned above. Could be. Yeah, I've I've haven't come across a tape that doesn't have glue, which is easy to undo as well as do up. But I'd be interested to hear more about that. Okay, once again, unfortunately, I can't read the Russian alphabet. So I don't know what your name is, but um, hello from Russia. I've been watching your channel for three years now. Thanks for teaching me a sailor cat. Great stuff. And teaching me English. Wow. That's the added bonus. And I think you'll find on Joyrider TV, the quality of the English is very high. Oh, yes. So thanks very much for tuning in. All right, Joaquin says the 3M3903 has very good glue. Should have worn my glasses. Not seeing very well today. I haven't had any issues with cleaning it, but it sticks very well. The difference between good and cheap electrical tape is huge on the cleanup. There we go. Yeah, you. it's one of those things you don't really consider is when you're buying your electrical tape, well, to be honest, here in Greece, you don't get a choice. You get what's on the shelf or nothing at all. Uh, but if you do have the option to get the good quality 3M tape, 3M seem to have it all sewn up in the tape department, um, then uh, that's the one you should go for. All right, Philip's on board. He says, hello, ladies. Hello, Philip. Good to have you with us. All right, we've got more uh, people tuning in from Russia. This is really nice that you guys are tuning in. It must, I'm really hoping that this bit of Joyrider TV is providing some light in the less than ideal situation. Um, but thanks for tuning in and I hope that you're enjoying the content. All right, Philip says, freezing here in Ireland, roll on the summer, just ordered a new set of sails from Whirlwind Sails. Chip has been at the machine again, running off some sweet colours, uh, very nice colours available from Whirlwind Sails. Um, all right, Doby says, I'll look for those vids. Great to have you on board, Doby, as always. All right, Martin at Malcheski Composites 
says back to the tape. Now, Martin is a guy who knows about tape because he works with such stuff. He says, I use white electrical tape. The gum is not like the black and much cleaner. When I do, when I go to a regatta, I use some blue electrical tape on the parts I have to rig there. Cool. So is um, that way when we de-rig? Oh, right. This is very sensible, actually. So then when they de-rig the boat, if he's sailing with an inexperienced crew, they know which tape to take off, which tape to leave on. All right. Scotch 33 in many colours. So Scotch 33 tape. Um, this sounds very good. This, there's more to electrical tape than meets the eye. All right. Scott says solo stepping the mast is tough. One thing I use is a step ladder to get the mast up about eight feet at the back of the boat. Help to get the, help to get the boat past that point of inertia. Yeah, that is a great tip. So if for solo stepping. Let's just have a look at solo stepping. How can we make it easier? All right. So one way that you could make it a lot easier stepping the mast solo is if you've got the it's nice to have the boat fairly secure. So let's say you've got your boat on the trailer. Now, if you can have it on some sort of hill that is going down. So if this is the trailer. Uh, There's the boat. Um, a good idea probably to either have, I would say, to still have the trailer attached to the car. Um, I think I'm going off the screen there anyway. Or the car has just become a pickup truck. Um, if you've if you've got a bit of a downhill, you could put it on if you really want it to be as easy as possible. And then, like Scott says, have something like a step ladder at the back of the boat where you can prop the mast. And then the trick with putting the mast up solo is making sure that the mast step, this bit, is secure and there's no chance that it can jump out. So with the Hobie 14, Hobie 16, there is a mast hinge that can be used. I don't think it can be used on the much older boats, just on the boats from around 2000. But this mast hinge Basically, you could even make one out of if you've got um, an old chain plate, you know, the the stay adjuster, which looks like that with a load of holes in it. You could even make a mast hinge by cutting your stay ad adjuster, like maybe cut it about there and then just use pins. Um, to attach here and here um, to keep it all together so it can't possibly jump out. And then from here, you can just, standing on the trampoline, sorry, the pictures are going a bit low rent now, push the mast up, and then the gravity will actually hold the mast up while you go round and put your forestay on. You could also, instead of a hill, you could just make sure that the boat is back to the wind. So the wind is going from this way. And that means, you know, if it's a strong wind day, especially once you've got the mast up, the wind is going to be blowing onto the mast. It's going to make it much easier. All right. So back to the live chat. Um, Leland Lee says, I use this method and it's made my raising the mast easier. I think whether you're solo or with somebody else, the step ladder or put the mast on something technique is very nice. All right. Sean Morris says, just in case anyone's interested, I 
um, um, happened across a 2004 FX1 for sale in south of England on Apollo Duck, £2,400 with road trailer. I'd say, Sean, that is a great deal. So if you're in the UK and you're looking for an FX1, there's one going for 2400 with a road trailer, as we may have said before. That road trailer has got to be worth, if it's most road trailers that you see on a boat of that kind of age, are generally in pretty good shape. So that road trailer is going to be worth about £600 on its own, meaning you are getting an FX1, which is a great ride. Such a fun boat to sail for £1,800 plus the trailer. That is a good deal. Thanks for pointing that out, Sean. Um, yeah, check it out. Apollo Duck is the website uh, in the UK. All right. Uh, Martin says, be careful if the boat is not strapped to the trailer when st stepping the mast. Yes. Uh, bad things can happen depending on where your cat is supported on the trailer. Yes. Very wise words. So I would certainly make sure I've still got my front strapping on there so that when you stand at the back of the boat, it doesn't then violently do that. Yeah. All right. Scott says in the US, it's called a mast step link and worked on my late model 16s on all of my late model 16s. Yeah, I'm sure if you haven't got one, you'd be able to get one from Murray's over in San Diego or one of the other branches. Um, very good. All right. Fred says I have a mast hinge on my Hobie 16 from 1974, but have I have bought it and used in 203 or so could have been upgraded, I guess. Yeah, it could have been, but might be the original. All right, we've got Emery in Turkey. Oh, great to have you with us. Hobie 16 or Dart 16. Whoa, here we go. I uh, used to have a Hobie 15. Did you use the Dart 16 catamaran? All right, this is going to be the last question today, by the way, because we've been going for almost an hour. But with, I don't even have, I've got nothing to draw. Have I now? Yes, I think I've got something to draw. All right, so if you're watching this later, put it in the comments below. Would you go for a Dart 16 or a Hobie 16? Um, it is a very good question. All right, so one of the main similarities between the two boats is the length. And I think that I would say is where the similarities stop. So the Hobie 16, why would you... No, actually, let's go the other way. Why would you go for a Dart 16 rather than a Hobie 16? Number one, it is much easier to sail. That is what the Dart 16 has got going for it. It's less powerful and it's got a skeg hull. So the skeg hull... So I've not got the bow very nice. Says, does anybody mind? No, I don't. I don't think so. Rather than the asymmetric hull, what the skeg hull does for you is it gives the boat a central pivot, a more central pivot point, which is basically this area here. Rather than on the asymmetric hull, where your pivot point is really ambiguous which means the boat is much easier to tack and it's a lot easier not to stall. So the Hobie 16, definitely more difficult. Now, that is the number one uh, reason why to go for a Dart 16 rather than a Hobie 16. Reason number two, the Dart 16 doesn't have a boom on the mainsail. And 
the bottom of the mainsail is much higher than on a Hobie 16, which makes it much easier to move around the boat from side to side, which I think that's a good feature as well. Um, so it's a bit safer because it hasn't got a boom. It's less powerful, which means you can go out in more wind and it not be quite as much of a white knuckle <laughs> sort of like hold on, scream if you want to go faster kind of ride. So um, another good point for the Dart 16. Another good point for the Dart 16. It's made of, I can't remember what it's called now, but the plastic that basically lasts forever. It's a very, very tough boat. Um, if you sailed another boat into the side of a Dart 16, the Dart 16 would just laugh at it and you might get a small scratch or something, but you certainly wouldn't get a hole in your boat from another boat. So those are the winning points for the Dart 16. Now, the Hobie 16, the oh, actually, another one for the Dart 16, it's not as wide, which means when you're towing it behind your car or parking it on the beach or anything, you are getting those benefits of it not being as big. So it's easier to tow behind a car, doesn't need as much space to park it, those sort of things. There we go. Uh, now, the Hobie 16, major advantages are first one it's more powerful so you get going in less wind on a home dean uh it's also faster as we know it's a very fast boat the hobie 16 um and the third and final boat benefit of the hobie 16 is it's double trapeze so um everybody gets to go on the trapeze whereas the dart 16 is a single trapeze so there we go. So I would say if you are learning to sail a catamaran and you want to have an easy time and perhaps you'd look to get a boat to learn on and then perhaps after a couple of years to change the boat for something else, then I would say the Dart 16 is a really good choice. Um, but the last big selling point for the Hobie 16 is there are much many more of them in existence than the Dart 16. So you're more likely to find a used 16, Hobie 16 at a good price than the Dart 16. There you go. I think um, that pretty much covers it. All right, so just going to finish off with, I hope that helps there, Emery. Um, yeah, the Dart 16 is perhaps... Um, a bit more similar to the Hobie 15. Uh, but um, yeah, I think they're both very good choices. It just really depends on what you've got available um, in your area. All right, so we've got Ebby on board. Hello from Germany. Oh, here we go. About to decide between the 2003 Hobie Tiger and 2008 Nacra Infusion. Any opinions? out here yeah um yeah the newer boat is it's likely it's going to be a bit nicer just because it's newer but um back when i believe in 2008 the hobie tiger was still winning the formula 18 competitions at that point probably through till around um what would it be till around 2012 that's when the Hobie Tiger was no longer competitive in the F-18 fleet. But um, the big plus point for the Hobie Tiger is that, just in my knowledge, because we've been using Hobie Tigers since 96 when they first came out, uh, what I can say is they are extremely durable and very tough. They can stand up to a lot of punishment so it's a durable boat and it is going to last whereas the nacra infusion unfortunately i don't have so much experience with those boats so i don't know but i know that it's a great ride it'll be really really nice to sail 
but the tiger's nice to sail as well. Um, I would say it would come down to price and condition and um, yeah, price and condition because they're going to be pretty similar. I think the infusion in F-18 terms is going to be a more competitive boat. Um, it's got uh, more high aspect foils on there than on the Hobie. Uh, but it's a very close race there between the Hobie Tiger and the Nacra Infusion. So thanks for the question. Very good. All right. So there we go. I think that's about the size of it for today. So before you go anywhere or do anything, stop what you're doing and just hit the like button if you don't mind. That just means this video will then be put in front of more people, which means more people will get to benefit from all of this fantastic information that I've been dishing out today. So um, there we go. So thanks very much. Sign up for the Discord group. Um, if you go to the top of the live chat, you will find the link. Or I've probably still got it here. Yet yeah, there it is. It's at the bottom of the chat as well. So click on the link, join the Discord chat room called um, Joyrider Sailing Exchange. Yes. Um, and I'll see you. I think I'll put it as a premiere, although I might not be able to make it um, on Sunday. So the Show Us Your Cat Hobie 18 special on Sunday. Hit the like button. Thanks very much. And I'll see you soon on Joyrider TV with some more. Thank you.